Hello and so can welcome back to my second channel video. So here we tend to focus a lot more on the facts, stats and maps than we do on sensationalist headlines and milestones that you've probably seen everywhere else and that's why you might have noticed how over the past couple of weeks we've gone from a map of the world which looks like this where like some countries don't have any COVID-19 cases, some have a few and some have it much worse than their neighbours. In literally two weeks we went from that to looking like this. This is a map put out by the WHO less than 40 minutes ago and as you can see it just colours the whole world in some shade of blue showing how some countries have it much worse, uh, you know, such much better, I should say, than others per million people, and some countries have it much worse per million people. I mean, it shows all of the numbers per country. It's a fascinating thing to look through, um, but it also shows how the disease has reached pretty much everywhere. I mean, once you hit, uh, you know, Greenland, and once you hit Madagascar, I mean, you've truly hit the entire Earth, right? But the truth is, not actually entirely like that, because fun fact, there are lots of countries that have very few cases, but there's still some shade of blue. I mean, 0.78 cases per million people is pretty great. Even looking at Sudan, it's 0.1 one nine cases per million people with just seven, uh, you know, proper cases there, which is fascinating until you realize that South Sudan uh, doesn't show up with any data at all. And then I looked into it and I was like, this must be like a no data concern. They're the world's newest country. But as it turns out, any you know, source I could find does confirm that as of Monday, there were no confirmed cases there. And that's why I was kind of fascinated. It's like, oh yeah, so which, which countries do not have any COVID-19 situations? And the truth is, is it is very few. Any country that has any real links to most of the world is, uh, you know, very much infected on some level, some much, uh, you know, fewer in, with much fewer cases than others, some with many more. Uh, again, even by continent, you can see how it changes wildly from Mexico, for instance, to the United States of America. You can see how it changes all over the world. But the ones that fascinated me are the ones I wanted to talk about. So first of all, Western Sahara is always gray on maps because of the no data situation. Second of all, the Pacific Islands are pretty safe from most diseases, actually, um, you know, because of the lack of connectivity to most of the world. So right now, they're not showing with any cases. But then the other ones are the ones I decided to dive into because, like, okay, there is Tajikistan and Turkmenistan, two countries which, even though surrounded by Uzbekistan, uh, Afghanistan, and Kazakhstan, yes, the region is very creative with its names, but uh, basically Tajikistan and uh, Turkmenistan both do not have any cases, uh, you know, just yet that are confirmed, but you could chalk that up to the fact that it's a di di dictatorship. So instead, how about we look at, you know, the, you know, the place that is surrounded by two pretty infected countries, Saudi Arabia and, um, uh, you know, Oman, both surround Yemen, and there are no cases there. Well, I looked into that, and maybe this is the only wholesome thing you're going to find during this whole crisis because the warring parties in Yemen actually agreed to have a ceasefire just to prevent it from happening because again even though in reality the war is probably preventing some amount of testing from going on uh, they've decided you know what? we'll stop the war for now there's a bigger war the whole world's fighting and again in reality it's never quite as wholesome as the headline uh, does imply the fact that there's at least like some bit of hope for Yemen in the region like hey you know coronavirus is giving them something to, you know, have uh, in their ball point at least. Um, that's actually kind of nice right there. So which countries don't have COVID-19? The truth is very few. And you can imagine that unless very wild measures uh, stop worldwide, it will eventually hit those places. Because again, right now, as of recording this video, we are now at 912,000. Basically, we're going to reach the millions, right? Woo, milestone for the, for the virus. I mean, whoever's playing Plague Inc. must be real happy with themselves right there. But no, more seriously, you can see how just the number of active cases, which is more important than total cases, in my opinion, has just continued to kind of st skyrocket. Right now, that people have been, you know, people who have been tested, um, 637,000 people currently have it, you know, at this point in time, which is pretty nutty because you're also starting to see because of the rate of increase and the amount of, uh, you know, places that are being overwhelmed, the death rate has stopped, uh, you know, plummeting, as instead uh, started to go up. And part of this is because, like, oh yeah, there is only so many hospital beds, so many ventilators, so many. You know, there's lots of different things you need to keep someone alive with this disease because of the um, kind of violent nature of it against your lungs. Um, because of that, if you don't have those things, your odds of survival do go down. Your, the death rate, therefore, goes up. Um, that is something you're going to see with that. But also, um, the other thing about it is that, like, oh, yeah, so right now we, we see the death rate kind of rising. And it's mostly because, like, oh, yeah, fewer people are being tested. If you actually look at a country that is doing a pretty good job of testing, say, Iceland, um, you can see how, like, oh, yeah, most people don't have symptoms. Most people who get it will be fine, and then they'll be fine not to have it for a while afterwards. Um, and it's just down to the fact that, like, oh, yeah, we we only test people at high risk. There aren't enough uh, tests to even, you know, a country of 360,000 people. There's a lot of false reports they tested the entire country, but they did test people on a somewhat 
random basis. It was based on people asking to come forwards, but like they tried to test as randomly as they could. And they proved that half of cases didn't have any symptoms. There were a lot of positives who were, you know, th th they didn't know they had it because there was no uh, symptom of it that somehow uh, managed to spread it regardless. And that's the kind of, uh, that that's the big realization we've had over this, that like the reason this spreads so fast compared to anything else is because you don't know you have it for a very long time, or maybe you don't know you have it the entire time that you have it. That's what's led to the USA, which, you know, previously was like a, a big country of it, but now they have the most cases by a staggering amount, right? Like they have more than doubled, uh, you know, China, which was the previous uh, big, biggest pl uh, place of case. And also they've got more than double the cases of Spain. So basically this has become like a very USA specific problem, it seems very quickly, which is fascinating to look at because even then per million people, it's still not actually the USA's problem. If we show this map right here, they, you know, they're, they're pretty dark blue. I mean, that's a lot of cases, but I think the USA is actually pretty well equipped to deal with it. A lot of people are like, haha, this shows uh, current leadership wrong. And I think definitely could have been handled better, right? And maybe will be remembered by the voters as being uh, a thing about current US president. But what I instead think is like, actually the US um, has a pretty decent buffer, you know, the size of it um, against that. If you instead look at other countries, there are many doing worse per million people. So I showed Spain earlier, 2000 cases per million people. That is again, 20 times the, uh, that of China, because you know China really only had one province that was heavily infected. Even Italy, which is usually considered the worst, like, oh yeah, they're heavily infected in some regions, but as over the whole country, it could be worse. I mean, it's still one in just over 200 people has this confirmed, let alone the people who don't have it confirmed. Um, it's kind of ripping its way for a lot of countries. If you look at Switzerland, you see how like 2,618 cases per million people, but the mo most number of cases for a sovereign state excluding microstates, because just for, you know, fun fact, we have to go for it, because otherwise people will be like, you're excluding San Marino. Yes, the Vatican City has the most cases, then San Marino, then Andorra. Microstates have this much worse, probably people. But the biggest country that you can look at on a map and be like, haha, you suck, is actually Iceland. But the reason for that is because, again, they did a lot of testing, and they've, a lot of those cases include asymptomatic cases, whereas, for instance, numbers in countries that aren't testing so much are not going to include so many cases. So the reason I wanted to bring this all up is just to be like, ha, there are some countries that don't have it but likely are going to get. Again, is South Sudan immune? No, actually. They've shut down the country in a huge way. Internal travel, external travel. Um, even if we look at the map of uh, school closures, you can see they're on board with that one right there. Fun fact, pretty much the entire world has shut down their schools, with the exception being countries like Sweden, actually, where they've allowed local governments to close down their schools. And I think any school uh, that has children of the, or, you know, students over the age of 16 has shut down because they can actually do it remotely. And if you're 16 and you stay home, you're not actually preventing your parents from going to work. That's the theory, at least in Sweden. Um, but Sweden is doing something which a lot of, I've seen a lot of hate for this on the internet, like why aren't they doing what everyone else is doing? And uh, that's because they didn't shut down their borders to other EU states. If you're from, if you're in the EU, you can still travel to Sweden. Again, the Schengen area has shut down their borders mostly, but um, you know, Sweden, has uh, followed those criteria, so they've got shut borders, but not to other EU member states, which is true for Poland, Czechia, Norway, Denmark, etc. Um, so like they've they've bugged the curve in a lot of ways. And if you actually look into it, it's like actually, as it so turns out, Sweden is defying the lockdown trend. In the UK, we are on lockdown. Wait, do you wanna should we should we, go, should we show you that one fun fact? The UK is on lockdown. There's a prime minister man saying and everything. Um, a lot of uh, individual localities in the United States of America because. I guess we have to mention, like, it's not actually, you know, to call it a US problem is to, like, do that problem where you think that because a country is a country that it's, like, you know, like, diseases don't care about, you know, national uh, borders, etc. You can see how it's really a New York area, you know, like, pandemic. Like, this is, the New York area is, if you just take New York and New Jersey, you know, that, that two state area, which they're pretty close together by American standards, those two states have more cases than any other sovereign state besides Italy, which is, pretty nutty when you think about it on that level. Again, if you look at the other states, it's like, oh yeah, mostly not too bad per million people. So maybe that's a, a small solace for all of you out there. But um, if, you're, if you're worried about America, like again, some areas very bad, some areas not. That's kind of how it was in Sweden too, actually. And Sweden has decided to defy the trend that we've seen elsewhere. And I find this fascinating because a lot of people hate on it being like, how, what are they doing? I mean, the, the biggest critics are like, the material presented by the public health authorities is weak, even embarrassing. But I find it fascinating because, you know, here's a here's a restaurant that's open even during COVID-19. You can't stand at bars, you, but you can 
if you get a table, sit down and eat by yourself if you'd like to outside. Something, it's wacky that that's like, oh, I can't believe they can go to a restaurant and they can sit down and eat a meal. Oh my God, they are living in the, in a, a post, you know, they're, they're living in some crazy pre-virus, uh, you know, times, even though it's post-virus times. But the truth is, uh, they actually have advised individuals like, hey, you can stay home, it is, a good idea if you do that. Social distancing, I mean, the Nordic countries aren't used to that, but like, there are a lot of voluntary measures in place and public gatherings of more than 50 people are prohibited, um, but private meetings, meaning you can meet people who are outside your household. There's there's no banning people who leave their house in the wrong uh, circumstances, etc. cetera. Um, that's the kind of plan in Sweden. That is their crazy decision. And people are saying it's like herd immunity, which, you know, I, maybe it is, but like, if they, if they have the public health resources, if they can keep life going on, is it worth doing so as a country? And the truth is, is like, well, I mean, they're actually seeing it as not being a country decision. They're seeing it as like a, a individual decision. They're putting the responsibility for the virus down to the people in the country, as opposed to on the governments. And I wonder about that, because if you compare that to say, I don't know, the UK, where there is a there is a Mr. Man, He look, he's got a flag behind him and everything. The UK is bringing strict curbs on your private life to uh, you know prevent things. You can't have any public gatherings of more than two people. Um, you know, there are no, uh, all, all shops that sell non-essential goods, which includes McDonald's. Wow, so sad for this channel, right? I mean, or at least Andrew Andrew's channel. Like, you know, my third channel, destroyed by this, <laughs> destroyed by these closures. Um, any non-essential goods are closed. Any non-essential work is effectively meant to be closed. And this is seen as like the good thing to do, right? Like Sweden, Sweden bad for telling their citizens to do good. UK good for effectively making it a crime not to do good, you know, forcing businesses to shut down, forcing people to shut down, etc. And I think about this one a lot because Obviously, you know, the, 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 the proof is going to be in the pudding, right? The only way to know is to fast forward a month and to see which, um, you know, like, uh, method has more success. I mean, if you look at, you know, this this happened a week ago, uh, as of two days ago. So, like, I guess that's a week and nine days ago. Let's just, let's just go nice nine days ago. In the UK, even though it takes, like, a week to really catch on to the numbers, you can see how the, you know, the UK is like, oh, yeah, you can't see so much of the difference. We still had our most cases in 24 hours by a pretty decent amount. We're still rising up that spike. Whereas Sweden, which has effectively just said, hey, you know, manage this one on yourself, guys. Make sure you you calm down. You can see how Sweden is actually, uh, you know, like still not going on the exponential phase yet. They're still getting more cases most days than the previous days. They're still on the upward part of the spike, but it's pretty manageable, even in comparison to their neighbors. If you look at uh, Sweden, and Norway, which are pretty similar countries. I don't think it's crazy to say. They literally have a giant border, the longest in Europe, I believe. Um, but like um, Sweden and Norway, Norway actually has uh, slightly fewer cases, but it's more per million people. Sweden has 490, Norway has 891, despite Norway going full lockdown, full, you know, everyone stay at home, etc. cetera. Um, but even both of their graphs, you know, again, you can see how both of their graphs, despite the difference in government uh, approach, both look much better than, you know, let's just look at, I don't know, let's look, let's look at a country that's going to get us all depressed. Let's look at Germany's graph and it's going to be like, oh yeah, that is not looking so good. Let's look at the graph for the USA and it's like, oh wait, it's going to be all the way down here. And it's like, oh dear God, that is not looking so good, right? The truth is, is it seems as though the response to this um, and the impacts it's having are yet to be seen, but it makes me question in the end, like, would it be better to just like advise people or do you have to tell people to lock down? Because what I see, you know, as soon as you lock people down is like people, you know, like even though that this this happened 24th of March, later that same day, and this has happened every day since then, you can see commuters who are on fewer trains and they're packed in like this. You can block people, you can say that you've banned people doing these things all you like, but because of the nature of you know the world and the nature of public transport in big cities, this is going to happen. You can see a billion clips off it. Here's one from ITV, in case you don't trust the BBC. Um, you can see how like, oh yeah, a train arrives and all these people, social distancing, following the, the government regulation of two meters apart, right? Um, and this video isn't here to be like, oh, look at those, look at those, oh, I love those people over there, they've got two minutes between them, I'm jealous, they should be doing what I am doing, staying at home as far apart from each other as they can. Um, I hate that lots of people are using this as like, a, oh, those monsters, they are making the virus happen. No, the truth is, is like, the requirement for modern life is that you have to go to your work, and until you make it, um, you know, um, until you have some way that people can, you know, pay for all of that stuff without having to go to work, and their work will let them, because... It doesn't matter if the government says don't go to work. If your work says go to work, you will go. And all these people will have to go cram themselves in. And, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't have a public meeting of more than two people. Uh, again, two, which I think two people 
<laughs> it's just saying don't gather in public at all, right? But like um, a public gathering more than two people being banned um, might mean nothing when this is happening every single day. This is from literally yesterday, by the way. And it's going to happen every single day for the foreseeable future. You can shut down public transport, but I mean, my point here is that, um, you know, also, by the way, it's worth mentioning, just as a little fun addendum, uh, places are collapsing because if you tell places they're not allowed to legally be open while they still have rent to pay and staff that they ideally would like to pay, a lot of places are going under, uh, you know, and honestly, maybe the one thing I take from this, because like, that I, I question in the end, like, can you trust the people? Should you just say, hey, it's important for public safety that you don't go outside of each other if you absolutely have to, sure, you know, like, because it is a public issue, like, public health is a public issue for all of us. Should you force everyone to follow what's good for the public best, or can you trust them to do it individually? That's a big question that we're, we're only going to know if it was a good idea way later down the line, right? But until then, uh, something that I guess is, like, the only... Uh, nicety to this because if you look at Bright House and you look at Carl Lucio's, the two first big places to collapse and put, you know, between them it looks like uh, 6,000 jobs, uh, you know, on the line. Like, yeah, that sucks and it's not good and we shouldn't be cheering for companies to go out of business. But something that I do think about with all of this is like, if there's one solace to the idea that all of these places are shutting down, etc., if there's like one small thing, it's that like at least a lot of zombie companies that have existed for like 10 years might go out. Again, this is like the only thing that I can hold on to is like, maybe there's something that comes out of this because there's going to be a crisis every X number of years, right? Like, the, there's a reason that no one ever goes, oh yeah, from now onwards, or people do say this, but they're wrong. From now onwards, there'll never be another crisis. But if we think about uh, zombie companies, which are companies that are so bad and inefficient that are only generating enough money to cover the interest on their loans, and interest has been at historic lows since 2008 crisis, we never rose them again, which means you can borrow money very cheaply, which means that being able to just pay back the interest on your loans, you know, the equivalent of a person who is just paying the interest on their card, but on a company-wide level, sometimes a very big company-wide level. But, um, you know, when you look at these, um, all of these zombie companies that are existing, maybe the good news is at least, like, forcing people to close. We'll see which businesses are being responsible, uh, you know, actually having enough savings to cover staff beyond that month's take, and which ones aren't. I don't think that's, I, don't, I think we shouldn't be cheering for anyone to go out of business. I don't think that's a good thing at all. But if there's, like, one solace from the current situation, if there's, like, one tiny bit of good, it's that, like, at least when this all comes out, we're going to hopefully be, you know, unlike every other crisis in history, because people keep like to say, like, oh, yeah, this is a real big problem, right? Unlike every other crisis in history where everything slowly ramped down and had to be slowly ramped up, um, what's just happened with this is the whole world has just paused for a bit. You know, like, again, lots of places, you just, they just aren't, Loads of stores just aren't open. Uh, I've got a friend who's, who's enjoying the fact that like his store isn't open. He doesn't go to work. Makes some money for a bit because he works for a pretty stable business, it sounds like. Um, you know, like, when as soon as people are willing to go back to work, they should have some, you know, if they have been paid, which, again, is big if and it's a whole thing, they should have some amount of money where they're like, let's go spend. And it's not that you can undo the damage done in this quarter, but you should be able to get the economy back to normal fairly easily by comparison, or maybe this is what brings the modern economic systems we know it down uh, to collapse. I don't actually think that. I think that's actually highly unlikely. But it is fascinating that uh, we're going to be seeing a lot of changes happening. And I also want to know, for once this is all over, the question of like individual liberty. Like, should you trust your populace to do what's good for all of them themselves, or do you need to force them to do it? Because, um, yeah, I, I feel like forcing people in Western democracies, you know, again, it clearly worked out for China on some level, but, you know, how much, what, uh, what, you know, what number of lives, what number of cases, what number of, uh, you know, quality of life years do you have to, to suffer on both ends of the scales? Um, because, again, in this case, we are talking about, you know, like a very interesting divide between the people who have to suffer the most between, you know, lack of, you know, the, the thing that the people who are spread it the most are going to be younger people in that way, right? But the people who, uh, you know, are dying the most and who are catching the most are on the older spectrum. It's like... We, we have a crisis in the world, you could call it a wealth crisis, you can call it an age divide crisis, and this is like a funny thing of like, how do you decide which end, um, you know, ha sacrificing one group of people's rights for one group of people's lives is a great idea, on some level maybe, but it's going to cause an even bigger resentment between those groups. Or to put it this way, um, every single time, you know, like people compare this to a war, in a war, you know, the young people of that country, even the ones who have no idea what's going on, are the ones who are sent to fight and die. And isn't it kind of funny, like, in this one, to, in a, in, it's the reverse, but like, oh yeah, you're sent to 
give up your freedom so that others don't have to fight and die. And it's like, I guess that's nice when you say it that way. Anyway, I'm gonna be indoors for a while. I just think about this a lot, non-stop all the time. I'd love to know your thoughts and opinions. Uh, stay inside, it's a good idea. Even if your government doesn't force you to, you can still do it. Isn't that a crazy idea that we've all lost the idea of? Again, Sweden is being like criticized on a lot of ends because like, why aren't they forcing their citizens to do things? And it makes me sad. It's like the death of liberalism as we know it, right? And maybe that's a good thing. For, and I don't know who for. I want to believe it's a good thing for something, but I don't think it's a good thing for me. Uh, or for anyone who values making decisions on an individual level as opposed to a collective level. But maybe, maybe that's a good thing overall. Anyway, thank you for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Because, yeah, there are some countries without uh, the virus at all. And that's... That's the little bit of hope we can have until you, you press control R and you realize that it's all changed. And the, I don't know. Anyway, thank you for watching. Second channel. Don't care. Bye.